Welcome everybody to We're Not in Campus Anymore, a webinar designed to help librarians in rural communities to help local students in the college search process. I'm Elizabeth Kunze, a first year library and information science student here at SI. And I'm Jeff Iverson, a second year library and information science student at SI. And I'm Jennifer, I'm a second year school media specialist. First I'm going to quickly go over some of the nuts and bolts of Blackboard's collaborate function. On the left of your screen is the chat box where you can comment or ask questions. Feel free to ask any questions you have as they come to you since we'll keep a running list and address them all at the end of the webinar. You'll note a small hand symbol at the top of the chat box. This is the raise hand function which allows you to flag yourself as having a question or problem. During the question and answer section at the end, you can either ask questions through the chat box or raise your hand and we can call on you so you can ask your question through the microphone on your computer. If you accidentally click the raise hand button or you no longer have a problem, just click a second time and the icon will disappear. You'll also note a vertical toolbar alongside the chat box. The second symbol from the top is the magic wand tool which allows you to click on the screen and leave a mark where you've chosen to click. At this time, please click on the magic wand tool to indicate on the map where you received your undergraduate degree so that we can make sure everybody can hear and see properly. Great, thanks everybody. So let's get started. And again, if you have any issues or problems during the webinar, don't hesitate to bring them up in the chat function. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to give us a brief overview. Hi, thanks Elizabeth. So um, the subject of this webinar is that underserved poor and rural college bound students have more difficulty than other new college students in navigating the college selection process. In this webinar, we hope to address how school libraries, public libraries, and academic libraries can help these rural students to be successful in the search process by providing services that address academic, social, and financial issues. Our entire webinar is going to be divided into three parts. So Elizabeth will start us out by giving us some background on the specific difficulties that poor and rural students face when they're first attending college. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's already been done to address the issue. And then Jennifer will conclude with some ideas about what we as future librarians can do to continue addressing this issue. And then at the end, we're going to have a couple of minutes to uh, answer your questions. If at any time during this presentation you have questions that you would like, uh, what you can do is you can type them in the chat box in the lower left hand corner of your screen and we will try to answer your question by the end of the webinar. So uh, Elizabeth will now get us started by giving us a little bit of background information. Thanks, Jeff. According to a recent study, only 34% of high achieving students in the lowest income quartile attend one of the United States top 238 colleges, compared to 78% of high achieving students in the top income quartile. The study concluded that elite American colleges are doing a subpar job of recruiting economically disadvantaged students despite claiming to value diversity. In fact, many low income students with high test scores and grades don't even apply to top colleges, perhaps because they aren't aware of available financial aid or because they don't know about the colleges available to them. Based on the same study, less than 10% of low income students are doing effective college searches compared to 64% of high income students. In this study, an effective college search is defined as one that involves applying to a variety of schools such as a safety, a match, and a reach option. More than 50% of low income students apply to schools that are not an academic fit for them, making it less, less likely that they will be admitted and more likely that if they are, they will experience a lot of academic and social difficulty keeping them once they're at school. In addition, a recent New York Times op-ed detailed the author's difficulties in coming from a poor rural family to college, among them her parents' ignorance of the admissions and financial aid processes, having to choose between the SAT and the ACT because of the cost involved, and the lack of college recruiters at her school compared to Army recruiters. It's obvious that low-income students suffer many disadvantages which limit their ability to achieve their academic and personal potential. These difficulties can be summed up under three categories money, time, and background knowledge. It may seem inane to, inane to say that low-income students have less money than their wealthier counterparts, 
but access to money actually affects much more than the kind of house you live in. Poor students often find it hard to pay for the many standardized tests required by universities to even consider their applications or test prep books to help them prepare, or the expensive application fees charged by colleges to process their paperwork, or even travel costs to visit potential campuses. They're also much less likely to have internet access in their homes, which is a huge advantage when trying to do the college search or to submit applications which are increasingly paperless. Also, many low-income students work one or two part-time jobs in addition to their coursework, making it more difficult for them to find time to do a thorough search or visit campuses, which can help narrow down a student's options and make it clear what's appropriate for them. Finally, many poor rural students are the children of immigrants or immigrants themselves, or they're the first in their families to consider college, meaning that their parents and relatives are often just as confused by the complicated process of applying to American universities as they are. Many families may be simply unaware of the large amount of financial aid and scholarships available, or uncomfortable sharing their financial information because they're embarrassed or afraid of scams. Some families may not fully understand the differences between standardized tests, and still others may not be fully supportive of their children's wishes to pursue formal post-secondary education. So how can local public and school librarians help these students? This webinar is designed to give rural librarians with limited resources ideas and techniques for better preparing and guiding low-income rural students toward appropriate institutions of higher learning. The Center for Student Opportunity recommends that educators ask questions about the college process based on three categories, access, opportunity, and success. Access refers to the information available to students about different colleges and how high schools, communities, and universities encourage students to seek higher education. Opportunity refers to the financial assistance and scholarships available to low-income or rural students, as well as support from universities for students during the application process, such as fee waivers for applications. Success refers to programs in place at the university or college to mentor, orient, and support first-generation and low-income students once they come to campus. In this webinar, we'll focus on the themes of access and opportunity, which we think can be addressed at the public and school library level and how those librarians can ease the already difficult and complicated process of finding the right academic fit for each student. And now I'll turn it over to Jeff, who will talk about techniques and ideas already being implemented in libraries. Thanks, Elizabeth. In this section of our presentation, I'm going to talk about what's already been done to ease the transition to college for low-income and rural students. Broadly speaking, libraries have been involved in uh, many different forms of outreach. These include public libraries playing an active role in their communities through programs that get people using the library, such as bookmobiles. It also includes digital resources, informing patrons online about how the library can help them through research guides and webinars, to name just a few examples. It's important for us to note that there are two sides to a transition. There's the before, while a student is considering attending college, and after, when the student has started attending college. As Elizabeth mentioned earlier, it is after they start college that students from poor and rural backgrounds have a hard time keeping up. It's therefore important to get students used to the idea of what's in store for them before they first arrive on campus. This transition can be especially difficult for individuals who are the first in their family to attend college. Even the question of where to start looking can be daunting. Through outreach programs, both university libraries and rural public libraries can help to ease the transition from high school to college. One excellent example that we found is the College Bound Nebraska portal created by the University of Nebraska. This example was actually created by the financial aid department at the University of Nebraska, but we thought that the style of the website was definitely something that an experienced outreach librarian should have no problem creating. College Bound Nebraska includes detailed answers to questions that students may have, such as, why should I even go to college? Where should I go to college? How do I pick which school I want to go to? And how do I plan for everything that I have to plan for that involves going to college? This resource, we think, does a great job of serving as, as a pathfinder for those who are unfamiliar with the admissions process. And it's also a good example of a way that colleges can reach out to prospective students. Digital resources can also be a vital tool, tool for communication with a rural population. In fact, the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, or ARSL, highly recommends taking advantage of webinars, like the one we're doing right now, so that librarians working in a rural setting can stay connected with their patrons and with each other. 
In fact, ARSL has a list of archived webinars on their website that they recommend. We'll be providing a, uh, the link to ARSL along with other resources that we think would be useful to you at the close of the webinar. There are several advantages to making resources such as databases, research guides, and webinars available online. And these advantages include cost. For one thing, it's a lot easier to publish a pamphlet online than to worry about having to print it and figure out how to distribute it and all that kind of stuff. Um, access is also another advantage. Many people in rural areas live miles from the nearest library. Having resources online means that people can access needed information from the comfort of their own home without having to drive a long way. Also, there's no limit to when online resources can be accessed. So if your library happens to close at 6 p.m., no problem. Patrons can still access your databases as long as they have a library card. If you work at a library in a rural area, I highly recommend that you look into the ARSL. They provide all kinds of resources for rural librarians, including how to engage with your community, where to find inexpensive resources, and one of my personal favorites, a humorous you know your rural librarian when list. Bookmobiles have long served as an effective way to deliver library services to underserved populations. Greg S. Borman at the San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science cites them as essential to those with geographic or physical barriers that prevent them from reaching the physical library space. Bookmobiles are vital to parents who homeschool their children and populations such as the Amish who could not otherwise use digital resources. While in these cases the population served as pre-high school, getting people into the library at an early age makes them more aware of library services. If a child grows up thinking of the library as an educational resource, it's more likely that as a teenager they will come to the library with questions about college admissions. We must also consider that some rural populations do not have access to high-speed internet. So while there is less that can be done with bookmobiles, they are still a vital resources, resource that should not be overlooked. And in fact, in some areas, bookmobiles have been utilized as a unique solution for a lack of high-speed internet access. These include the Cybermobile used by the New York State's four county library system, which is in upstate New York, or uh, the Rural Outreach and Delivery System, or ROADS, which is used by the Beauregard Parish Library in rural Louisiana. We think that this idea has a lot of potential, and it's something that we'll be talking about a little bit more later. But now I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer, and she's going to talk about what we as librarians can do with this information to improve things for poor and rural college students. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So I'd like to build off of what Jeff just talked about to highlight ways that your library could help high school patrons find out what they need to know about choosing the best college for them. From large-scale collaborations to hosting interactive workshops to simply providing hard-to-find information, your library can provide your patrons with valuable resources that might not be available to them otherwise. Some of these examples are already integrated into other libraries' programming, as Jeff just discussed, but think about how incorporating more than one or all of these ideas into your library's programming, whether you are a public or school librarian, could benefit your college-bound patrons. School libraries and public libraries could collaborate with local colleges to help make the dream of attending college a reality by providing information, academic counseling, and personal support. This can be achieved by hosting career days, highlighting new or unfamiliar fields of work, by teaming up with college admissions officers to identify the right high school courses for students to be prepared for college, and by facilitating meetings between prospective college students, existing college students, and maybe even college professors to help your patrons understand the demands of college and how to become better prepared for it. Your library could also work with colleges and school districts in your area to identify patrons who might otherwise fall through the cracks without your additional support. One example of this is CollegeBound, a collaboration between Purdue University North Central and area public school systems in northern Indiana that provides assistance, counseling, and scholarships to qualifying students. Since 2005, this extensive program has helped over 600 low-income first-generation college students from different backgrounds get into college. Another thing that your library could do is host in-library or virtual workshops. This is a great way to disseminate lots of information to your college-bound patrons. By hosting experts or by becoming an expert yourself, 
you can focus your attention on the specific needs of your community. You might consider hosting workshops on the Common Application, which is a free online undergraduate application that is used by over 400 colleges and universities. This workshop could be facilitated by a school media specialist and focus on the purpose of the Common Application, how to navigate the website, the process of applying for college, and even teaching essay writing workshops to help students understand how to draw attention to themselves through creative and well-written application essays. Also, workshops on filling out FAFSA forms and finding information on scholarships and grants can mean the difference between a low-income student going or not going to college. Your library can provide patrons with the information they need to finance their college education. Beyond helping students choose the right college for them and learning how to apply and pay for it, you might also consider providing a series of information literacy workshops to help these students become more prepared for the academic demands of college. This is already being done with a program through Kent State University. Since 2003, academic librarians have been working with high school library media specialists and teachers throughout Ohio to assist with the information literacy instruction of high school students. By making connections with school library media specialists and initiating new modes of communication, the Kent State academic librarians have developed professional relationships and friendships that have helped high school students with the transition to college academic life so they are more likely to stay in school. You know, this type of service is becoming more and more important as schools across the country are eliminating media specialists from their programs. Public librarians could fill this ever-expanding gap in high school information literacy instruction by making connections with local high schools to provide such instruction. For first-generation college students, sometimes simply providing them with information on resources that they don't know about, both online and in print, is an extremely beneficial service. For example, the Better Business Bureau warns college-bound students and their parents to be wary of financial scams by companies promising scholarships, loans, or grants from college tuition, for college tuition, taking people's money but providing them with absolutely nothing. Over the years, complaints against scholarship, loan, and grant services have increased dramatically as more and more companies take advantage of unsuspecting consumers via the Internet. Providing your patrons with the resources they need to find and information on how to avoid scholarship and grant fraud and to investigate the reliability of companies in the financial aid industry is an easy means of limiting your patrons' vulnerability and ensuring that they are able to make sound college-related decisions. Wouldn't it be great if you could save your patrons from the threat of these scam operators just by giving them the tools to help protect themselves? So Liz has a couple more things that she wants to d discuss. Hi, everyone. I wanted to elaborate on some of the very specific ideas that we have that rural uh, libraries can put into place to help students. So one major issue for students is finding affordable transportation to testing centers, which might be miles away in the city, or to vi visit college campuses they're interested in. One way to facilitate easier movement is to cooperate with the local high school to sponsor a bus to SAT or ACT test centers. And another idea is to encourage students to visit campuses together via carpools, which might be advertised at the library and the high school. Second, it's really important to remember that college isn't necessarily for everyone, and many students might be interested in a trade such as the culinary arts or cosmetology. These options are less expensive and time consuming than four-year colleges, yet they still set students up for stable, well-paying careers. Make it a goal to collect information about local trade programs and training options for interested patrons. And another idea is to reach out to local professionals to set up apprenticeship programs for students to gain relevant experience, like with a local doctor or electrician. And finally, colleges today place a really high premium on extracurricular activities, something I'm sure we're all very, very familiar with. And so that can be difficult for a rural student to uh, maintain if they're not athletically inclined or they don't have a lot of disposable income to spend on an instrument or equipment or they can't travel to get somewhere. One great way librarians can help students with this is to organize local free opportunities for community service. For example, high performing students could volunteer to tutor classmates or students could do free landscaping services for local nonprofits or government buildings like the library 
or even the local highways. So be creative about ways high school students can be involved in their communities and still build their resumes at the same time. So ultimately, our most important piece of advice for you all is to, it's a business cliche. Know your customer. Although rural libraries have many qualities in common, every town and community is totally different. And it's crucial for any librarian to be aware of your patrons' wants and needs to serve them as best you can. So now we want to go into a question and answer time. If anybody has something they'd like to say or address. And um, we've also turned on the microphone now if you'd like to ask questions that way. Okay, so we're waiting 10 seconds. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> okay. Well, we do have a, a, a phone-in question from Carrie, a public librarian from Dakota, Oklahoma, and she wants to know if her local community college might be interested in collaborate, or how she might find out if her college, local community college might be interested in collaborating with her library. And that's a great question. Um, many of these collaborations that we talked about do happen with local community college, and I would suggest that you contact your community college's, college's admissions office to open up the conversation to get things rolling. Um, I've got another call here. Uh, Susan from Lone Post, South Dakota asks, what about tribal libraries, libraries on reservations? What kind of options are there for these libraries? Uh, well, I could recommend, you could still look at the ARSL, um, which that's the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, uh, because they have a lot of advice for people in sparsely populated areas that's helpful. Uh, specific to Native Americans and libraries on reservations, though, um, I recommend taking a look at the ATALM, that's the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And their website has a lot of great info specific to Native Americans in libraries. Okay, we have another question from Bernie in upstate New York, and he says, don't you worry that by giving information on financial aid, grants, loans, and scholarships that you're in jeopardy of providing misinformation? This is definitely a concern, but by hosting experts, and remember that you can use them digitally or become an expert yourself, you can provide your patrons with the most up-to-date information. And also, by providing your patrons with the tools they need to evaluate sources themselves, they can really help them, even help them to help themselves. So Kristen asks, I'm the only librarian in my rural community. How could I take all of this on and still get everything done? <laughs> and she's worried in the wilderness. Um, so this is great because this is how you can collaborate with your school librarian if you have one at your local high school or if you have um, a counseling office at your local high school that you can use resources at your high school and work together to develop these programs. And I'm going to go ahead and plug the ARSL again on that one. They have some nice shortcuts for you, you know, asking, or no, excuse me, telling you uh, good ways to find, say, cheap books, DVDs. Recommend a lot of going to yard sales and stuff like that. Um, so we've got another question from Chris B. We have these programs, but none of our teens want to participate. What else could we do? I think that goes to outreach with your library and, and developing programming that's geared directly towards teens in your area. Find out, again, go think about your patrons. What are they interested in? What resources do they have available to them? What resources do they not have available to them? And even if it's a fun activity that gets them into the library, um, that's, that's your door into getting them into college um, prep programs. Another question, do you have any collection development suggestions for helping with college career prep? Yeah, I think a great way to do that is to partner with the local school and try and buy college prep materials in bulk. Maybe ask for donations from the community or look for grants to fund that sort of thing. And then you can have it like an encyclopedia collection where students can come in and use it and not check it out so that it's always available. Um, I think that's a major expense for students. Um, some of those books can be like $75 each, um, and it, you, know, you only use it for that one test. So I think it's a really great idea to look for ways to um, get those options cheaply. 
Also, another thing is that those books don't change very much from year to year. So it's possible to get used versions from like one or two years ago and keep using those later. So we've got another question here from Chris B. We have parents actively discouraging their children from college. Any suggestions for working with the parents? Well, of course, that's a bit of a tough one because parents are, you know, really the ones in charge of raising their own children. Uh, if you could, I mean, if you're in a small community and you know the parents well, it wouldn't be out of order to maybe talk to them and tell them some of your concerns. I think, though, that you should bring the uh, young adult in question into the conversation as well. Maybe try to figure out, is college right for this person? Also, I think that high school counselors would be Definitely. good people to have this conversation with as well. Because it is true, college is not necessarily the right answer for everybody. We just won't, don't want people to be missing opportunities as so many in rural areas have been. Um, I want to go quickly back to Kristen had a follow-up question to she's the only librarian in her rural community um, saying that alas in the wilderness we lost those positions years ago. I think that goes back to really finding um, a community college in your area because they'll most likely be the most willing to collaborate with you and maybe they have the resources that you need to provide these programs and you don't have to take it on all by yourself. Yeah, I think rural librarians need to be especially proactive about finding funding from outside of the tax base. Um, even though a lot of people in rural communities might be doing okay, they might not be um, contributing a whole lot to the local library, so it's important to kind of stay on the ball, look for money anywhere you can get it, and try and, uh, try and invest that in the library the best you can. Okay. Um, and Jackie asks about um, whether the odds are already stacked against you in college applications. I think the Common App has helped a lot with this. Um, obviously, there are a lot of quantitative. Um, there's a lot of quantitative data that colleges review in their initial stages of um, processing applications. But I think that we would go back to the idea of providing an essay writing workshop and giving students the idea that they're a unique individual and they have something to contribute and colleges need to know about that, that they can get themselves out of the maybe not pile into the definitely for sure pile. So we're starting to run out of time, so I think maybe we should have that be our final question. So one more thing. We just wanted to remind you of this fabulous idea. Wouldn't this be awesome? And Jeff wants to uh, talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, this is just something that we thought, like, hey, what a cool idea, roving Wi-Fi hotspots in the bookmobiles. And this actually has been implemented in some places. I found an example, actually, in the Chattachoochee Valley uh, library system in North Georgia. And I didn't make that name up like I did the other towns. Um, <laughs> but uh, so they bring uh, books, DVDs, CDs, and six computers that connect to the internet via satellite link, like basically around the area they serve. And we just thought that was really cool. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for joining us tonight. And if you wouldn't mind, please type your unique name in the chat box. Um, so that we can send you an email of all the resources we have referenced in this webinar. And please don't hesitate to contact us. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody's doing it. And um, in the email, we'll also provide a link to an evaluation of our, of our webinar. Please complete the survey to help us better serve you in the future. Thank you so much, and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, guys.